Last week, we looked at igneous rocks, and igneous rocks, we said, came from a melt. Now, the next step in our rock cycle, as we looked at it, is to look at sedimentary rocks. Now, sedimentary rocks have to go through a bunch of processes. You have to start with a pre-existing rock. With that pre-existing rock, you then weather it and erode it, and then transport it into some other type of particle or dissolve it into a liquid. You deposit it and then you lithify it into a rock. So it has four distinct stages that you have to go through to make a sedimentary rock. Now, with sedimentary rocks then, the way, the mode in which they are dissolved or pulled away from their original source and transported and deposited divides them into two distinct categories. If you erode away, weather and erode away the rock by dissolving it into a liquid, so, for example, salt water. If you look at salt water, the reason it's salty is that it contains the mineral halite. It contains salt. And so, therefore, that is dissolved into the water. If you took some seawater and then dried it out, put it out in the sun, it would precipitate out salt crystals. And so that is how we make a, the precipitant type of sedimentary rock. The other type are where you actually transport physical particles is through some media, either water in a stream, or ice can transport them, or wind in a desert, bring them to their new area of deposition, deposit them, and then lithify them, makes the second category of rock. And these are what are called clastic rocks. And what we will do first is we will go through how clastic rocks are put together, and then we'll do the precipitants later. Okay, so the first thing we can take a look at is that we have some examples of particles. And the way you divide out the particles is by their grain size. So the size of the particles are going to be what we will divide them out by, and then those will be compressed and lithified, as it's called, and made into our rock. Okay, so here we can see we have a bunch of different types of particles. This is sand. Okay, these are pebbles, gravel, and this is clay. Okay, and if we solidify these into different rock types, then we can divide them up into our textural category for classifying these rocks, which are known as clastic sedimentary rocks. Okay, so clastic sedimentary rocks are made out of particles, and we use our textural term in our classification scheme. Remember, it's texture and classification purely based on the grain size. Okay, so, as I said, we start off with something that looks like that. That is a clay, okay, and it's a very fine-grained. You can squeeze it around. It's very soft in the hand. However, there's also something that looks similar, which is called silt, and there are very minor differences in grain size that are hard to see that way. This is what we call sand, so it's the same thing as you would see on the beach. These are pebbles. They have to be greater than 2 millimeters to be considered pebbles, and above that, you can have something like this, which is called a cobble. And finally, a little bit bigger than a cobble, and all the way up as big as they come is what's called a boulder. And this is what is called the Wentworth scale of grain size. Okay, now we take these particles, transport them someplace, drop them down, deposit them down on the ocean floor, or the beach, or whatever we're going to drop them. Then we squash them together, and they become what is called lithified and you lithify them, it means you're making them into a rock. And now we're going to take those same grain sizes that we used before, and we're going to name these things rocks. Okay, and so these will be the clastic rocks. Now we have a bunch of different sizes that I have down in front of me. These are, as I said, divided by their grain size only. So that's a textural classification. And we can see that we have on, on this side, we have some fine grain rocks. This is a, a shale and a silt stone made out of the silt. This is made out of clay to be shale. It's made out of silt to be a silt stone. In the middle, I have a group of sandstones, different types of rocks made out of sand. And on the right, I have coarse grain rocks that are made out of the coarser materials. If we start with these, we can see that this one has some very coarse grain. So this is a, a cobble conglomerate. Okay, it's a conglomerate when you stick together the rocks. Now, to make it a conglomerate, the grains usually have to be round. If they are not round, as you can see in this case, and they are angular, this is what is called a breccia. So a breccia 
is a coarse grained rock with angular fragments in it. Okay, so this would be a cobble breccia. Okay, the next thing we can see is something with a little smaller grains, and the white dots on here are all quartz grains. Okay, these are quartz pebbles, okay, because you can see they're much smaller. If you look closely there, also you can see that they're rounded. All right, so this is what we call a conglomerate then. It's a quartz pebble conglomerate. Okay, so that's how we would, we would call it, just based on, obviously the quartz gives us some composition, but nonetheless it's that grain size that really makes it. Okay, now when we deal with the sandstones, the sandstones are, have a little bit more of a subdivision based on their composition. All of these rocks are sandstones, they're made of sand-sized particles. Okay, this one, if you take a look at it, has kind of white, almost the same color as sand. Okay, and this, is, if you look closely with our hand lens, we would see that this is a quartz sandstone. So we would what we would do is look close and see that each one of these grains in here is a piece of quartz sand. All right, so this is just a quartz sandstone, otherwise known as an aronite. Okay, so this is an aronite sandstone. On the other hand, we can have some other types. This one here is really also an aronite, but look at the color of this. If you look closely, you'll see that all, it's still all quartz grains in there. However, what we have on here is cement. This has been put under what is called hematite cement. So this is also an aronite, but it's a hematite cemented aronite sandstone. Okay, so this is a little bit different based on the cement that which was added later. So if you were to take this sandstone, run some fluids through it containing a lot of hematite, they would deposit the hematite in between the grains. Okay, and that's what gives it this color. And you'll notice that around here when you drive around in your car, you may see a lot of red colored rocks in this area. A lot of the rocks in, in this, what is called the Newark Basin where we are now, are hematite cemented rocks. Okay, and so that's what gives it this color. You can have other cements as well. You can have quartz cement, you can have calcite cement. Each one will give it a different character to the rock. Now, if we add a certain amount of clay to our sandstone, fine grain material, clay tends to be dark in color. And so what it will do to the rock is it will give it kind of a grayish color. This is what is called a gray wacky sandstone. Okay, named for the gray color. So you can see the difference in this original sandy colored rock and the gray colored rock because of the addition of clay. Finally, we have this one, and this still looks kind of similar in color. However, if we take a close look at this, you will see that there are a lot of these orange grains mixed into this sandstone, and those are potassium feldspar. So this one actually has a large component of feldspar, greater than 25%. And if it does have feldspar in it, then we call it an arcos. So this is an arcosic sandstone. This is a gray wacky sandstone. This is an aronite sandstone. And this is a hematite cemented sandstone. The last two we have on this side are the first, the siltstone. Again, this comes from the Newark Basin. Notice the red color in it. It is hematite cemented. Sometimes it is very difficult to tell the difference between these two if they were the same color. So what you need to do is you can, uh, the old time field geologists would break a little piece off of here, stick it back between their molars and chew it. And if it was gritty, it would be siltstone. And if it's smooth like butter, then it would be a shale. Okay, and so you could try that too if you want, um, but don't eat all our samples, okay? Eat, eat lunch before you come. Um, in any event, these are two different types. The Notice on here we have some plant fossils. So in fact, these sedimentary rocks typically are what where we find uh, fossiliferous rocks. And so shales are a good place to find especially plant fossils. This shale obviously had to be formed someplace on land because it had plants. Otherwise, it would have marine organisms if it was in the ocean. Okay, we saw some of the clastic rocks, okay, and as we said, those were transported as particles. Then we also have the other type, which we say are transported in the fluid state. So in other words, these are dissolved materials that are transported along, and then somehow it's removed back from the water as a precipitant to make the other types of rocks. Now there's a bunch of different categories, and we're going to separate them into two distinct categories. We're going to call one of them 
what we call carbonates. And carbonates are anything that is made with the carbonate mineral. So it could be either made out of calcite or dolomite. And the last group, we're just going to lump everything together and call it an other. Okay, so that's the way we'll break them down. The first thing we want to do is to look at the carbonates. Okay, and the carbonates, we're just going to kind of break them into three parts. But mostly what carbonates are is limestone. Okay, so anytime you want the general term limestone, that refers to one of these carbonate rocks, or one of the types. They can also be dolostones, which are made out of dolomite. Most of them, you know, 95% are made purely of, of calcite, and so are limestones. Typical of these things is to have kind of a dove gray color. So that's one of the ways you can tell them apart. However, the big thing is, is as you remember with your minerals, how did you tell calcite apart? Well, we put a little bit of acid on it, and it fizzes. Okay, and any of the carbonate rocks will always fizz. And you can contrast that to putting some on any of the other rocks here. And obviously, if they're not a carbonate, they won't fizz. And so that's the first way we can do this. And I know this means we're going to wind up using a lot of acid, but that's what you'll try to do. If you think it's carbonate, you already have determined that you think that's what it is, drop a little bit of acid on it and then be sure. And if it fizzes, you have no question that you're dealing with a limestone. We can divide the limestone into three basic categories. It's based on this. They can either be made out of lime mud or particles, okay, and that's it. So if it's all made of lime mud, like this one, notice it has kind of a, a this very smooth texture to it, and you don't really see anything in it. However, we put a little bit of acid on top of it and it fizzes. That is what is called a lime mudstone or a micrite. Okay, either one of those terms are acceptable. Now that means no fossils. On the other hand, you might have some fossils, as we see in this gray limestone, more typical color, where you can see a few of the fossils through here. That would be a fossiliferous limestone. There's both fossils and mud, okay, and that would make fossiliferous limestone. The last one is where you don't have any mud. All you have is a bunch of fossils stuck together, and this would be called either a grainstone or coquina, okay, and coquina I think is what they mostly use in the book, however it can be also called grainstone. So these would be the three basic categories that you'd break down for figuring out the differences between your limestones. Suppose you think for all the world it's a carbonate and yet it doesn't fizz. What am I going to do? Well you have one last test you can do on it. And that is in case it's made of dolomite instead of calcite. Dolomite tends to have kind of a tawny look to it as opposed to these gray looks of the, of the uh, limestones. So what we do on that case is you will powder a little bit up on your street plate and then put the acid on it on there. The powder of the rock will fizz. And so therefore that's the other way to check. The last group of sedimentary rocks are also precipitants, but we call them the category of other. That's because there's a bunch of different rock types. We can't really nail it down and say, oh, there's just one where it was nice and neat, where limestones or clastics. These are kind of mixed up. Now, one group, I guess we can kind of subcategorize these, are rocks that form through evaporation. So these would be rocks where you had some water, seawater, either trapped on land or maybe sitting around the equator where it's really hot and you evaporate off all the water and you're left with some kind of rock. Okay, now one of them might be this thing right here and you see it's got a color, kind of an orangey color. However, the one distinctive thing about this, it tastes. This is rock salt. Okay, and so one of the things you can get is evaporate seawater. Obviously, you're going to get salt. And this, it can be this color, it can be clear, but nonetheless, something similar to this. Another one might be uh, something like this, which is typically white, but again, this can have all kinds of light colors to it. The dead giveaway for this is it scratches with the thumbnail, okay, and it is made of gypsum. So this is rock gypsum. In fact, gypsum is what they mine to make sheetrock for houses. So a lot of this is very important economically, of course, as the salt is. 
some other ones. So these kind of both form by evaporation processes. Other ones you might have are something that probably everybody has seen. This is coal, okay? And coal forms from compressing peat in a swamp. So these originally reflected that you had a swampy area, lightweight, very shiny, uh, reflective stuff, looks like a conchoidal type fracture to it, but also relatively light. The other one, last one we might have in this category, and there are others, but this is also a precipitant on the bottom of the ocean. You can actually precipitate out uh, silica in the form of what is called chert. So this is a very fine-grained, water-bearing quartz rock that has a very shiny surface to it. And this is called chert. Chert can sometimes be mixed up with limestone in looks. One thing is it's much harder, okay? So uh, limestone's made of calcite, which has a hardness of three, whereas this has a hardness of seven. But also the main thing is, easiest to check with, is it might look like micrite, but it does not fizz, okay? And so therefore, that's another way to tell apart your chert from your other uh, rocks. Last thing you're going to be asked to think about with this lab on sedimentary rocks is what kind of environment of deposition would these rocks lay down in? In other words, where were they laid down? Now, sedimentary rocks, most of our economic deposits that we use in this world come from sedimentary rocks. So really, for economic purposes, these are extremely important. So understanding the environment of deposition is very important. Okay, so we already kind of talked a little bit about that. We said with the evaporite rocks that they come, tend to come from something that where you dried it out. So it was an evaporite deposit where you had to dry out the water to be able to leave these behind. And certainly the two you've seen and others uh, wind up as evaporite rocks. The second one we talked about was a piece of coal. And we said that came from a swamp. So that had to be terrestrial, on land, something drying out in a swamp. Okay, so we looked at that. Next one we looked at was chert. This is where you deposit the silica at deep ocean levels. So chert tends to come from really deep in the ocean bottom. But what about the rest of the rocks that we looked at before? Well, we have limestones. Limestones are definitely marine deposits. Most of them are shallow water. So if you see a lot of fossils in it, it's definitely a shallow water deposit. Some of the black ones, these micrites, can actually be deeper water deposits. But in general, they are shallow water marine deposits in the ocean. The next one comes when we look at the clastic rocks. And obviously these can come from a variety of places. If we see something like this that looks just like a beach sand, it probably came from a beach. And so therefore clean quartz aronites tend to be beach sands. As opposed to if we looked at something like this. When they're red, it means they rusted. And that means they were exposed to oxygen. So whereas beach sands tend to go under the water, something that forms near on the surface or near in the uh, terrestrial environment, that's when we get that red color. So the Newark Basin, for example, wasn't underwater, it was out in the open. Okay, so a desert would also give you very red rocks. If you go out to the desert southwest for a vacation, you'll see that all of the rocks and things like the Navajo sandstone are bright red like this. The next thing we can have was this arcosic rock. And with the arcosic rock, this tends to be a mixed rock. Because it has different components to it, it tends to more likely have come from a river, where you're close to the source of where you pulled your material from. You're so st close to the source of derivation. And so you tend to get kind of a mixed up rock. And so that's why you tend to get these arcosic. So these were more typical of rivers. A gray wacky, because it's got some clay in it, is more typical of a deep ocean environment where you can settle out some fine grained material under the water in addition to having your sand. Now, in addition to that, we have our, our shales and siltstones. Now, obviously, shale, we can see, can come from a terrestrial environment. And if you're given some little evidence like this, like a plant fossil, you know for sure you're in a terrestrial environment. This is a swamp or something. However, most shales, black shales, come from deep under the ocean. And so there, if you go into the deep ocean, if you see no fossils on it or marine fossils, we're going to pick a deep ocean environment for the shale, as opposed to this one, which clearly came from a terrestrial environment. 
Siltstones are very similar, and one thing would give this away as being a terrestrial rock. What is it? You're right, it's the red color. So the red color here makes this terrestrial. If it was a black color, we would pick deep marine. So you, sometimes you have to use kind of two pieces of information to be able to predict that environment of deposition. And that's the last column on the sheets that you'll be filling out. I watched that video you showed me. Now let's do the lab and get this over with. And again, I do the same thing that I had done before. I will have a sheet to fill out. I have my rock sample. We have a bunch of unknowns. And what I will do is I will go through the same type of tests that I did before. Is it a clastic rock? Is it a carbonate? Is it a precipitant? Is it a carbonate within that precipitant group? And then I will go through and use my reasons why I'm going to identify this rock as is. And I will fill out the form. And as I said, the last thing will be what environment of deposition will, will this rock have formed in.